Hello friends, welcome to our channel. I am Profil, with me Jason. Hi Jason. Hi Profil, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm here, of course, to work with you on your English as a second language. To be clear, this is not an introductory course to learning English. There's, of course, many, many uh, programs, courses, apps that are available for that kind of a thing. Instead, I want to work with you on integrating your communication skills so you can communicate more effectively on a personal level. Would you like to begin? Yeah, sounds exciting, Jason. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to learn from you. And before we start, I would like to give a little bit background about myself and you. Uh, I'm Profil, I'm from India. So my accent is very heavily influenced by Indian language. So English is not my first language, so I'm struggling a bit. And currently I'm in Sydney, Australia uh, since last uh, couple of years. And uh, Jason is from Canada. I'm really excited to learn from you, Jason. Thanks for me for this opportunity. Absolutely, I love to I love to do this kind of thing, and I love to help. Um, and this is a common problem. I, I see it all the time, where people they have an excellent command of the English language, and their understanding is clear, uh, but they struggle in day to day conversation because of the differences and complexities in English on stresses on words and organizing the word structure or the sentence structure. Yep, true. Okay, so let's start here. Um, I went to this website, grammar.yourdictionary.com. Uh, they have a nice little write up here. So I'd like to just go over it with you and we can do some practice and work on it together uh, to maybe make this easier to understand and also to have some uh, feedback as we go so that it makes it easier for you to improve. Yeah, sounds great, Jason, thank you. Sure, so let's start with the use of an active voice. Uh, as it states here uh, with the English grammar, uh, you start with your voice. Every human language starts an active sentence with a subject or the person who's doing something, which in English is the verb. What's being done follows the subject. So if there is an object, the one who's receiving the action, it comes after the verb. So you see the formula here provided, uh, subject plus verb plus object. Now that sounds a little confusing and, and dry going through mm -hmm. it like that, but they have some excellent examples here. Yeah, so the subject of the conversation, you're gonna start with always either, it generally it's the one who's doing something. So in this case, the first one shall be, well, so the person is a subject, uh, Mary, the next one is a subject, the dog is a subject and third, and uh, I, referring to yourself and even it could be you know uh, a third party could be the subject so the united states you can start your sentence with that uh, but you don't want to have the uh, subject at the back of the conversation you want it to be at the forefront then you have your action uh, shall be dried the cat uh, and obviously the cat being the object in the conversation yep Okay, so stringing it together and, and having those sentence structures in this flowing pattern is pretty critical for clear communication. Uh, would you like to try the first sentence? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm really bad at pronunciation. I just want to make the, you know, pre-announcement. So I'll give it my best shot. It's, it's not a problem. Just try your best, and I'm going to provide feedback. Yes, yeah, sure. Shelby dried the cat. Okay, so Shelby dried the cat. Now, the speed at which you're speaking is not a problem. Uh, the emphasis on some of the words is a little difficult, and that's pretty common. So let's start with Shelby. Go ahead and say it again. Selby. Right, so you're not pronouncing the H. You, you said Selby, 
So you've just gone the S and on to the E, L, B, Y. So what you got to practice is breaking the words down. And, and this can apply to everything. And I won't go over it again uh, for this video. But break it down to something that you know sounds the same and you can pronounce clearly. So shall be, you can start with the word shell. We know if it wouldn't be pronounced cell, it'd be a shell. So you can shell. And in this case, the Y sounds like an E. So it would be shell B. Try that. Cell B, cell B. Okay, the sounding like cell, not shell. You need the you need the sh sound. Yeah, I think because of my mother tongue influence, a couple of few words, I, I think I, I am unable to pronounce it properly. I think you can though, but with practice, I understand it's not easy, uh, but definitely just practicing that sound and then integrating it will get you there eventually. But we'll leave that for now. It's just some advice on, on ways to kind of work your way around uh, issues with enunciating words. Yep, I'll, uh, I'll practice it later point of time. Cell B and cell and cell. Absolutely. Uh, I think we'll do a layer segment just, clear, just purely on pronouncing words and uh, enunciation. Sounds but good. for now, maybe uh, see how Mary walked the dog. Mary's the one doing the action is walked. And of course your subject or object is the dog. Does this make sense? Yep. Okay, we'll move on here. Now, linking ideas with a conjunction. So that's taking a different word to link the two uh, portions of a sentence together. A conjunction's a bit of a big word, but it's not, don't be scared of that. <laughs> so you want your subject, your verb and your object, like the sentence is above. And then we're gonna have the conjunction that links it together. And then your next subject and verb and object. So perhaps you might be um, combining these two sentences. So you're gonna go, for example, the dog liked Mary and your, your conjunction is and I, uh, Mary did not like the dog. For example, you can combine those two things together that way. Okay. And they do have a handy little uh, memory device, not mnemonic, mnemonic oh, device. Oh my goodness, you know, I've got it wrong. <laughs> mnemonic device uh, called fanboys. So each letter standing for a different conjunction word. Yep. Moving on, uh, we're going to use a comma to connect two ideas as one. They're coordinating conjunctions as I broke down above. Uh, they did put it together here. Instead of using a word to connect, we're going to use the comma. So it puts a space in your speech, basically, or pause. So I do not walk. Mary's dog, nor do I wash him. Put that pause in there. It connects the two sentences, but uh, without an extra word in it. Does this make sense? Yep. Do you want me to try it out? How? Absolutely. Let's try this one. I do not walk Mary's dog, nor do I wash him. Exactly. You have the correct pause in the sentence. So that's good. Uh, you've covered the subject, you've introduced it, and then you've connected it and completed your thought. And that's kind of a big key to clear communication. Now, number four is to use a serial comma in a list. This is a little less important. Uh, this is a bit nitpicky, you might say. Uh, definitely, you wouldn't 
worry about this so much for speaking, but you might for written communication. As it's here, the bottom line being that you would have multiple commas to string along separate parts of a single uh, thought or sentence. Would you like to try this one? Yes, yeah, sure. The R and the US are not sounding like a word. So it's pets are us. So it's a business name. Oh, that's a business name. I and now I got it. Pets are no us has lizards, dogs, and birds. Okay. So not bad, just a little bit fast. To me, I would say pets are us has lizards dogs and birds. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of a, a bigger break between the three points. Okay. Maybe we try one more time on the second line here. Sure. Pets are us, has lizards and frogs, dogs and cats, and pancakes and Make cows. I don't know the parakeets. word. Sorry? It's a bird. These are parakeets. Oh, okay. And what is the last word? Macaws. Yeah, that was correct, actually. What is that, actually? I don't know that. Oh, it's also a bird. It's just uh, a tropical bird there. I, I don't know too much. But the bottom line is, yeah. Um, might have been a little bit exaggerated on this part. I noticed a rather long pause after the pets are us. Uh, mm -hmm. So more, more of a flow here. Pets are us, has lizards and frogs, dogs and cats, and parakeets and macaws. Would you like to try one more time? Yes, sure. Pets are us, has lizards and frogs, dogs and cats. Parakeets and markers. Exactly. You missed the end, but that's okay. You had the flow right, and that was good. So I'll move on. Uh, we're going to use a semicolon. Now, this also is a little bit nitpicky. You would never really be aware of this in a conversation speaking, but uh, just to be technically correct, you can put together two sentences that are basically full sentences but related into one sentence using the semicolon. So in this case, Mary's dog is hyperactive. It won't stop barking or sit still. Just having that little pause in there, not too different from uh, the colon by itself, but in terms of written English, it's because you're separating two standalone sentences and bringing them together. Would you like to try? Sure. Meredith's dog is hyperactive and it won't stop barking or sit still. Okay. So, um, Exactly. So this eliminates the need for the and that you felt you needed to put in there, which is a little more, more like natural conversation. So I don't, you can't blame me for wanting to do that. Um, but that does remove the and or a necessity for and in a sentence structure. Okay. Now, number six, use the simple present tense for habitual actions. Basically, uh, your tense, of course, is denoting the time, the difference between what's happening or what did happen in a conversation or what will happen affects what words you use. So uh, their example, the things you always do or do every Tuesday are described with the simple present, which means now, right? Which just means you pick the basic form of any verb, um, such as I run to Shelley's 
every other day. So this is bring it to the present in your conversation. Mm -hmm. Would you like to try that one? Yes, you. I run to Celis every other day. Perfect. Now uh, we're going to move from present to present progressive for a current action that's happening right this exact moment. Uh, in this case, they're using drinking and the ing on drink is bringing it into that uh, immediate moment. And so actually I'm not gonna go with that one. Let's go with a little bit easier. Mary is playing with her hyperactive dog. So she's playing with it right now. Would you like to try? Sure. Mary is playing with her hyperactive dog. Excellent, yes. And that's exactly how that sentence would be put together and, and the correct flow. So the addition of ed to verbs creates a past tense for something that is not happening now or about to happen, but instead, of course, happened in the past. So I'll go through, um, she walked the dog to the park. So if this happened previously, would you like to try? Yep. She walked the dog to the park. Exactly. And present perfect for the unfinished past. Uh, present perfect can be confusing for some people as it says here, but it is one of the most important rules of grammar. Now, in this case, you have to use a helping verb. A helping verb is an extra verb word to illustrate uh, when this is happening. In this case, uh, obviously it is the have before drunk. If you say, I drunk three cups, it's not going to be correct. It doesn't sound right. It's got a improper flow. It's not a clear communications. So you would say that I have drunk three cups of uh, this lap saying Sushong tea today. In the case, you are saying, you know, that you did it, you drank, drunk it, and it happened today, and you're clearly defining your timelines. Let's go with a little bit of an easier one. Mary, I'm always picking on her and her dog, but we'll have you try it again with Mary's hyperactive dog has bitten me three times so far. Mary's hyperactive dog has bitten me three times so far. Correct. Um, I, I would feedback wise, just suggest watching the speed of some of these words, because that's what's making it unclear in your pronouncing. Mm -hmm. But in general, exactly right. Now we're down to number 10. Use present perfect progressive for an unfinished action and the past. Let's look here. So when the action as well as the time is considered unfinished, the verb loads up on present perfect form helping verbs such as to be and to have and changes to the progressive form. Uh, so we have some examples here. These progressive perfects verbs will have to all be um, italicized here just to demonstrate, but you would say the Western countries have been waging wars. So you're separating and adding uh, these two different points and verbs in order to define not just that this is a past and ongoing tense, but that it has been. So 
in the past and the present, this is occurring. So they say here, Western countries have been waging wars in the Middle East for thousands of years. We'll go with a little bit of an easier one. I have been drinking tea all day. Yeah, Let's that's try. that's true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let me try. I have been drinking tea all day. Exactly. Perfect. And our last one here, number 11, we're going to use past perfect for the first of two past actions. So we're going to combine two different actions and pair it together here. So I had not yet eaten breakfast. So I had the past tense, but I'm also going to say yet because I'm about to and then the past of eaten. So I had not yet eaten breakfast when Mary walked her dog. And so this also brings a tense for when timing this occurred. Would you like to try? Yep. I ha I had I had not yet eaten breakfast when Mary walked her dog. Correct. And and you know, she could actually get away even with putting a comma here just to put a pause in. However, that's just a bit of nitpicking on that. So profile, I, I hope this has been somewhat helpful in how to use your grammar, how to structure together your sentences in a more natural, uh, clear form. Yes, I have a few questions, Jason. Absolutely. Like there are only these 11 rules are important or there are so many rules uh, in English uh, language? <laughs> so uh, they are important just for clarity. Uh, most of these rules exist simply to make it extremely clear of what and when you're talking about so that there's no confusion, especially in the written where you'll find written is, is much more complex because there's room for interpretation and, and slang and colloquialism within the spoken English language that is not usually tolerated in official writing. Mm -hmm. So you feel like this is more relevant for written and how much relevance this rule says uh, to the spoken English as well? Well, there is some, of course, because if, you're, if your tenses are incorrect and if your uh, presentation of the object versus the subject are reversed, it's going to be harder for people to follow what you're talking about, even though you may have all the correct information. If it's not in the correct order, it will be confusing. Sounds good. So, so well, anything else I can clear up? Yeah, I think today is a very good uh, introductory session. I hope we'll learn, I'll learn more from you in coming days. Absolutely. I'm happy to be there for you anytime. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.